Tokis uh, uh, universal random matrix kernels and elementary quantum mechanics, and, uh, uh, and in some sense, this combination of subject uh, appeared to, to me quite accidentally. Because last last year I was uh, teaching random matrix uh, uh, theory in the Warsaw University, and I was also teaching quantum mechanics here in Krakow, and, and somehow this completely two different ideas uh, started to interfere in my brain, uh, and uh, this is the result of this interference. Uh, I, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, very much discussion with my uh, young colleagues. I think all of them, except for Jacek, who actually is now in London, much not at uh, Paris, uh, are, are here. Uh, and uh, this was started as a pedagogical example, uh, may uh, turn into a serious publication. That, uh, uh, we are working on this project at most. So, uh, I don't know how much you know about random matrices, probably some basic knowledge or not at all. Not much. Okay, no, not much. Okay, so let me, let me I, I will be pedagogical. So, so, uh, so, so basically, uh, uh, random matrix models, uh, according to mathematicians, were born in 1928 which is precisely 90 years ago, when uh, uh, John Wishart uh, has uh, uh, constructed some sort of a generalization of the chi-square distribution, and I will show you this in a moment. Uh, two years earlier, uh, Erwin Schrodinger solved, uh, without any relation to Wishart, he, he, he solved uh, his Schrodinger uh, including several cases, also the hydrogen atom, uh, and uh, actually one uh, year after we saw uh, Salomon Bochner, uh, born here in, in, in Krakow, he, he wrote a small paper on Schrodinger operators, which also is not related neither to Schrodinger equation nor to uh, not to be short, and at least was not related for, for the last 90 years. And, uh, uh, what I uh, would like to convince you today that there is some kind of a quite amazing entanglement of, of this of the three different ideas. Uh, uh, so what is uh, what is we short? Why we all claim that we short uh, is a great thing? Uh, we know that uh, one of the most uh, one of the most uh, known examples in probability is so-called the chi-square or gamma distribution when you when you are uh, taking identical uh, independent Gaussian distributions, you are squaring these variables and uh, and then. I think them, and then you, you ask what is the probability density function of such distribution, and this is just this, this one. And it, it plays overwhelming role in all, all kinds of testing of the hypothesis, uh, analysis of variance, etc. Et so basically, what we had wanted to do 90 years ago, he wanted to generalize this concept in the case when instead of one measurement, because you have several species, okay? So, so basically, instead of one xi, you have you have more, you have n. So this is why it's called multi-variant. And then, so you can, uh, depending how, uh, how how sexy is to be your example, you may think that these are, for example, the measurements of the, of the n stocks at different times, or some animal species, or whatever you like. Okay, it's a, it's a general structure. And then what you can, uh, if you take such matrix X and then then you square it, this matrix does not need to be squared, can be angular. I would assume that the time of measurements is larger than the number of, of, of species. Uh, uh, then uh, we can form a 
we can form a co correlation matrix. So this, the elements of this, uh, the elements of this uh, uh, matrix tell us what is the correlation between entry i and entry j over the time window, uh, over the time window t. Okay, so what Richard did, and uh, he he proposed the distribution of the elements of such of such matrix n, and this is, this is all given by this. And this formula, you can do it for real case and you can do it for complex case. I, I here I wrote it for complex case and I would be always considering complex case because it's it's, it's, it's it's easier. And if you compare this line and basically when you the, the double number of degrees of freedom, you, you basically see that it's the same n is equal to one. Uh, uh, and uh, so 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 this is indeed a generalization of this uh, of this uh, of this distribution. So this was this was Richard and uh, it played a role in multivariate uh, statistics. Uh, however, uh, random matrices uh, underwent another valves in the in the in the fifties where people wanted to understand the statistics of the heavy nuclei. You know, of course you, you remember this word the times you don't remember. I don't remember. We all know that it was the times of the Cold War, and the idea of exciting a very heavy nuclei with a slow neutron was had several important practical issues, so uh, applications. So this, so this is why people started to look at uh, people started to look at uh, uh, at such uh, object, random object, and basically there was this uh, absolutely fundamental paradigm formulated by Digner that uh, you may define statistical physics in new sense. Usually you have the same Hamiltonian and you make uh, several, you start from several initial conditions and you are get an ensemble and with this ensemble you, you, you average. Uh, this paradigm of Digner uh, uh, was the following, that you have a statistical ensemble of Hamiltonians. So you don't know anything about Hamiltonians except that they belong to some kind of a symmetry. So basically, this means that these Hamiltonians are represented by random matrix, uh, and uh, the elements are, in the simplest case, are, are taken from Gaussian, despite Wigner took just binomial distribution 0 and 1. And what he, what he discovered, he discovered that the eigenvalues of such matrices have some absolutely amazing correlations, which, which, are, quite, uh, which are quite universal. This was a spectacular success because he got, he got the statistical properties of the spectra of such Hamiltonians. He got a perfect agreement with excited nuclei, and people looked at molecules, and people looked at uh, uh, whatever, at the mesoscopic systems, uh, and, and, and this started this triumphal march of random matrix theory. So, what do you want to do? We want to understand the spectra. So, of course, if you, if you would, this matrix, this matrix M, is a, is a symmetric or Hermitian matrix, so you know that we can diagonalize it with the help of unitary transformation. So it's obvious what would, what would happen with the first term, with obvious what would happen with the second term, but what is important is the price from going from elements to eigenvalues. And this price is the Jacobian. One has to calculate the Jacobian. I will not calculate this uh, uh, Jacobian. It's an easy uh, exercise. And basically, the Jacobian is a Van der Mottian square. I don't know if you if you remember what is uh, uh, what is Van der Mondian. Van der Mondian, this is basically such determinant that here you have ones, here you have lambda one, lambda two, lambda n, lambda one square, lambda two square, blah blah blah, lambda n, and then lambda one to n minus one, lambda two to n minus one, lambda n to n minus one. This is n by n of the Mondian determinant. And then an interesting thing is that this of the Mondian can be rewritten as lambda i minus lambda j from i uh, smaller than j. So if you more up to the side, okay? So if you don't believe me, you might take Van der Mondian, 1, 1, lambda 1, lambda 2, this determinant modular design. It's, it's like that, okay? And, then, and you generalize, for example, by induction. So that, that's, that's the case. So this is this Jacobian. And then 
in the in the sixties, uh, two guys, uh, uh, Michel Gauguin and uh, Meta, uh, have discovered an absolutely amazing trick. And whenever I think about this trick, I am I am always uh, uh, I am always puzzled by the ingenuity of this trick. You know that you can you can you know that you can do different things with uh, uh, with a determinant. In principle, what you what you can do to you can add to any uh, to any row you can add to the linear combination of any other row, and then uh, and then the value of the determinant is not changed. So so here you may have also the general polynomial of the first order, lambda one plus something. Here general polynomial of the of the second order because to this one you can add. In our combination of this and this, etc., etc. So basically, instead of this, you might build it with absolutely arbitrary polynomials. You only have to be careful that the highest uh, coefficient has to be one, that's what, uh, and then uh, uh, and that's all basically. And then using the same determinant of the, uh, the the same properties of the determinant, you may you may absorb that mass here. Into you may absorb that mass into into the vectors and the columns, and then when you do it, and notice that this is this van der Monden square, then you may see that this joint probability distribution can be rewritten as one over n factorial determinant square. So determinant is just this guy, and uh, and psi are just the functions, the polynomials, and these polynomials are dressed. With the with the factors coming sim sim uh, you symmetrically put them into one and into the second uh, into one determinant or at the second one coming from the square. So this is this determinant. And immediately, if you are a physicist, this rings you a bell. Okay, this rings you a bell because you see that this is basically a slater determinant. So this is slater, which is absolutely amazing that uh, in this Fermanic language you can do it. Because it's a strongly interacting system. You see, because of this van der Mondian, all eigenvalues interact with themselves. All, all them see. But in this funny language, you may see that everything, using some elementary properties of determinant, you may also rewrite the square of the determinant as a determinant. I should tell you too much. Sorry. Uh, this uh, square of the uh, determinant can be rewritten as determinant of some universal fu function, which is a kernel. So actually, two-point kernel, if you know this two-point kernel, from the knowledge of this two-point kernel, you may, you, may, you may get any information in randomatic theory, because you can, you can, get, you can get this. Yes. So, uh, again, if you look, uh, if you look uh, what, are, what, are, what are this object, this object looks like a wave function. Actually, if you remember your classes from quantum mechanics, modulo missing square root of lambda, you see that this looks pretty much like a hydrogen problem. Okay, this goes like R. This is uh, associated, uh, some associated factor uh, related to angular momentum. And these are the completely general polynomials. But it's nice to take polynomials orthogonal with such bases, and such polynomials are called like polynomials. So actually, you see, there is a, a lesson that this uh, problem of finding all the correlation functions can be can be easily mapped. To the quantum mechanical problem of radial Schrodinger equation, uh, and we we know that it's a completely integrable system for any n and any l when they are on the main and the angular momentum. This means integrable system for for n and t. So this is the first lesson. So then we are in the uh, in the nice situation that perhaps knowing this, we do not need to solve random matrix uh, theory from scratch. Well, we may look, uh, this is a photograph of the handwritten sentence by Richard Feynman during his Caltech lectures, uh, that the same equations have the same solutions, okay? So if the same equations have the same solutions, perhaps we can use our knowledge of Schrodinger equation to understand random matrix theory, okay? Uh, so the first thing is that before Schrodinger solved his equation in, uh, in 1926, mm -hmm. our approaches uh, leading to so-called old quantum theory, and one of the uh, and one of the successes was uh, was the Bohr-Zomerfeld uh, Bohr uh, formula. This is a semi-classical formula. Semi-classical formula means that 
you, 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 you get this formula as some kind of a consistency condition when you make a semi classical approximation and you go with going constant going to zero. Here you may see that basically the analog is very close, and then one of the teeth is just the length of the matrix is like a Planck constant. So this is the same limit. So now there's a very celebrated result, actually, the result obtained by Marchenko and Pastor in the in the 50s, in the 60s, sorry, who got the spectral form, the, the average spectral distribution of the of the visual distribution of the visual distribution. So and there are many ways of getting it. However, the, the simplest is the, the following, that basically you take semi-classical equation for energy, you know uh, how the energy scales with n, uh, you calculate p from this, it means you have to solve a quadratic equation, you plug it and you represent it as a, uh, and you represent it as a, as a spectral density. You, I will show you soon why this is a spectral, uh, why this is a spectral, a spectral density, but basically in one line we can, we can get much on capacitor distribution. I would like to, uh, to stress maybe in this way that uh, I was uh, somehow inspired here by, by Terence Tao, who used, of course, in a much more rigid mathematical way, but he used the same trick of understanding famous Wigner semicircle. Because when you take famous Wigner semicircle, you know that for harmonic oscillator A goes like M, you do some rescaling, you plug it here, and then you get the Wigner semicircle. So this is, uh, so this is why. Uh, of course, you may say maybe it's accidental. This is semi-classical. Why wouldn't we just do it like like we are taught in, in the, in the, during the elementary? Uh, uh, so let us do it how we are taught. So this what you see here is the spectral density by of Wishart matrix. So this is this uh, smart central pass to distribution or uh, uh, or uh, the spectral. So I plotted just the spectral uh, the spectral density. The, more or less the idea is the, the idea is the following that you, that you know that when you when you have a potential you have a Coulomb core and then things die like that. So if you if you look at, at bound energy you know that classically you you have return return points and your particle oscillates. Here and here. So this R minus and R plus are just these returning points in this, uh, uh, in this game. So if I would write it on the uh, momentum space, I would get probably something like that. Uh, uh, where uh, for fixed energy, for fixed, uh, for, 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 for fixed energy. Okay. So this would be just just two points. And then the projection of that onto this, this is the much capacitor. Uh, capacitor distribution. So whenever you look at this uh, Martian capacitor distribution, you see that it has actually three interesting regimes. You see two, but I will show you that there is also the result. First, I may look, I may start to count how many energy levels I have in the vicinity of any point which is inside the spectrum. Okay? I can ask the same uh, concerning the, the edges. So let me look, look uh, first. I know that the total number of eigenvalues is n, so this means that the that, uh, number of eigenvalues here, I have to integrate the spectral density which is, which is some very narrow, narrow interval. I am integrating it uh, because this is a small integral, I can approximate this rho of x by rho of x0. And then this gives me the number of eigenvalues, or the fraction of total number of eigenvalues n in that very narrow strip. Of course, everywhere that should be it should be n. Okay. So now, if you if you see that if I would like to get a meaning, meaningful uh, result, for example, one average uh, one level within the beam average uh, spacing, then this means that this s has to scale like that because this is the limit which gives me the correct answer. I can repeat this. At the, I can repeat this at the, another point. This is at this point. And then you see this guy has here the square root singularity. So when I make a square root singularity, I make another integration, and I have another, another state. And then, surprisingly, we can get another uh, scaling. You see where r minus is equal to 0. It means my left 
edge touches, this is x, and this x cancels with uh, square root of x cancels with x, I get singularity 1 over square root. So this is the hard edge, I cannot go farther because the, it's like hitting the wall, okay? And when I, uh, when, I, when I do it, I have another scaling. So I have three different scaling corresponding to, the, to, this, to this kernel. So what, what do the eigenvalues signify here in this analogy? No, certainly not the energy levels, right? No, I get the, the eigenvalues are just, uh, mm. uh, yeah, what is, what they, uh, I think it's formal. I think it's it just, it, just uh, it will, uh, this, 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 this equation, uh, this, 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 this equation will be just mapped mathematically onto, onto the, but they are not, they are, you are right, they are not energy, they are not, they are not energy levels. This is just, I am just using the fact that the same equation for the spectral problem looks formally the same, the same way like, like the Schrodinger equation. So now let me, let me, let me go again to quantum mechanics. You see this kernel, which I wrote here. So this is this kernel, okay? And I can write this kernel in more known quantum mechanical language, basically using bra and cap notation. So when I write the bra and cap notation, this is my kernel. And obviously you see that this is a projection operator. Why is the projection operator? For any finite n, it's a projection operator. Because when uh, uh, when I square it, because these functions are, are orthogonal, I am getting just the same just the same value. Of course, when n goes to infinity, naively, when n goes to infinity, I know what will happen. I will complete my Hilbert space with all the space, and, and then this will be not a projection operator. This will be a unity operator because I would I, 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 this is the completeness of my states. But now I can think about following exercise. I am looking. At the spectral bound. So I am assuming that my uh, Hamiltonian is bounded by the highest value of the of the of the energy level. For hydrogen, this is just minus one over four over n squared. Uh, you shouldn't be worried about four because this is just the square of the ball radius in my units. Okay, so so basically, generically, it's one over n squared. But then I am doing two things. I am not only naively going with uh, with large n, but also at the same moment. I am imposing this particular scaling of my variables. So it means I am making a change of the variable, and then I am scaling the variables, and I am scaling the, the energy level. I will show you in a moment what, what, is, what, is, what, is, what is happening. So what, so what it means? It means that I take a Schrodinger equation from every textbook of quantum mechanics. Uh, this equation is written in dimensionless units, so everything is rescaled by the, by the value of the, of the energy. So this is my Schrodinger equation, this is my condition, my, my, my condition rewritten like that. Then I am making that scaling about x0, I am smearing it a bit with, with, uh, with the scaling. And uh, I am dividing it by t because I want to get rid of this t because I don't have them in the Schrodinger equation. And then I am plugging this into this equation. So I am calculating trivial Jacobian. Okay? And then I take a larger limit. Remember that k in, in, uh, goes like n and nu, this is like a difference of t minus n. Uh, where t and n go to infinity and the ratio is kept fixed. And then, surprise, surprise, I'm getting such a simple bound, okay? So I'm getting such a simple bound, and therefore, when I plug the zero, when I plug here the value of the margin capacitor distribution, my spectral bound is even simpler. This is a very simple bound on the differential equation. So we, when we want to decipher what it really means, we, we have to find some useful transformation which will convert the differential equation into, into, into some kind of algebraic property giving us the domain. Uh, so again, if you use our knowledge from quantum mechanics, you see that this, what you see on the left hand side, this is just a free Schrodinger operator. So if you have a free Schrodinger operator, this means that the solutions are the plane waves. So the idea is to make a Fourier transform. If I make a Fourier transform, so t is the Fourier transform corresponding to minus i d over ds. This is the bound. So you see that this funny deformation in the bound which are made 
is basically it tells me that the momenta are not going from minus infinity to plus infinity, but the momenta are going on the stri strip from minus one half to one half. And that, now you can understand this very nice idea of the spectral projection. Because if from the very beginning I would not use this deformation, if I would use my plane waves, for example, I can, I can make a Fourier transform, then from the Fourier transform I can t take the inverse Fourier transform, I can add it on many, any probe function, and I, I would get precisely the same function, because this is just the completeness of the, of, the, of the plane waves written in such a way. Okay, so this is just, so this is just one way of rewriting a, a, delta, a delta function. But, this is what happens in random matrix theory in the bulk, is additionally restricted by, by, by that condition, it means that there is a deformation, there's a projection of this unity, and that deformation of this projection of the, of, the, of, the, of the unity means that I don't integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity, but I integrate from minus one half to one half. So this is this famous universal kernel. Usually it's not written like that, because this is a because this is a trivial integral, so people can people can calculate this integral, and then as a result they are getting this they are getting this uh, Dyson 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 curve. So this means that in the bulk in the scaling we have one universal function, and every quantity is explained in that in that function. So now I can you see I can play again uh, now at the soft edge. When I play at the soft edge, I look what happens to my Schrodinger equation, and on the left hand side I get a Schrodinger equation like that. Again, this means that I have a kinetic term, and this means that I have a potential, which is a triangular potential. Okay? I know that uh, if you take any textbook of quantum mechanics, or, or if you had uh, recently classes of quantum mechanics with me, you know that the solution is the A-B function. Okay? So if the solution is the A-B function, I would uh, precisely do the same kind of trick like I did previously, but instead of Fourier function, I would put the Airy function. I can make an inverse, I can plug this, and then I, I am getting the, the following bound, the t is smaller than, than, you know, the t is smaller than, than zero. So, so now I have, uh, so uh, now I have again the identity, so this is some complicated expression for delta function we written in terms of uh, Airy functions which you can find in Mathematica. But now I am making a projection. I, I am making a projection. When I make the projection, I see I integrate from minus infinity to, to zero and to plus infinity. So this is not unity. This is again this kernel. And since the Airy functions have this nice feature that when you differentiate the Airy function twice, you are getting uh, you, are, you are getting the argument of x multiplied that uh, that function. You see that everything which is here is actually a total derivative. It's, it's straightforward to, to see. And since we are in quantum mechanics, the wave functions die out at infinity. You are getting the Airy kernel, and that is the Airy kernel which is usually written in the textbooks. Okay. And then the last hero is the deformation of the half edge. We, I, I, I do the same. I'm getting this kind of uh, I, I, I'm getting this kind of uh, uh, operator. And then again, uh, doing quantum mechanics one, you rec immediately recognize the polar part of the of the of the Laplacian. So you see this must be a two-dimensional case. If this is a two-dimensional case, you try to to use something which is called two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional Fourier transformation, which is sometimes called Bessel Fourier transformation, or sometimes Hunger transformation. So when you do you you do a Hunger transformation, the inverse Hunger transformation, you you see what is the result of Hunger transformation acting on the operator. It's straightforward using the properties of the Bessel functions, and you see the Hunger transformation. Is, this is just t squared multiplied the Hunger transformation of that function. So this means that that bound means that t squared has to be smaller than 1, and since t squared has to be positive, this is the end of the story. Again, the same procedure. Delta, my bound, and then this is this, uh, and this, and then this is this Bessel, Bessel kernel, and actually here I don't even need to calculate this integral, because in 19th century, a German mathematician called Lambert has calculated this integral. I don't know 
for where, but but this is if you if you take any textbook of random matrix theory, you take this this function. So okay, so we are uh, so we have uh, so that, uh, till this moment we are still very very pedagogical, and then uh, we say okay. I, I all the time I was using this name that these kernels are universal. Okay, if something is universal, uh, this means that it has to appear in several branches of science without any. Uh, actually, any reason <laughs> in some sense. Okay, so so what I have uh, done, I have uh, uh, prepared for you few, I think three, three or four examples, which are uh, which were shocking for me. Okay, which, which were uh, uh, shocking for me when these kernels appear. They appear in many branches of physics, and this is why science, and this is why everybody uses random matrix theory. Uh, but uh, uh, recently we got all excited that uh, Sir Atiyah uh, solved the Riemann hypothesis. So uh, let me uh, recall to you what is a what is a Riemann hypothesis. Okay, so this is the function which, uh, which Riemann has suggested, and then you may you may look at this function as an analytical uh, continuation in the in the uh, in the S, uh, and then there is a hypothesis that if you look not non-trivial zeros, the trivial zeros are minus two, minus four, minus six, etc. But non-trivial are uh, the, the Riemann hypothesis says that non-trivial uh, zeros on the complex plane of that function are on the critical line one half plus i t, and t is the position of the zero. So there is a critical line of the zeros, and all of the zeros. Are on that line. So this is this is still today. This is considered as one of the most challenging and most spectacular problem in mathematics. Hence this great excitement two weeks ago when uh, Atiyah has announced that he has solved the, the Riemann uh, hypothesis, which is debatable, which is not uh, not totally acknowledged. Uh, and uh, this is of course one of seven million new problems of Clay Institute. The prize is one million dollars for, for for solving that, etc., etc. So actually, so what people try, people try to, to do some numerics to, to check if this is indeed the case. So first three or four zeros were checked by Riemann in 1859. Uh, Turing uh, has checked uh, uh, in uh, uh, more or less in the 50s around 1,000 of the zeros. Basically, Turing's idea was uh, Turing was believing that uh, that he will uh, also. Hypothesis. He wanted to find a, a counter uh, example, but uh, he managed to, to check it up to 1000 zero that he gave up. Uh, then uh, Odwyszko, usually called Odwyszko, uh, he checked it up to 10 to 23 zeros. And I just recently I checked the Pobert Hierarchy, checked it on the examples of 10 to 32 zeros. All of them are on the line. Okay, and then Dyson, Montgomery, and Ludwiczko. Uh, uh, Mon Mon Montgomery and Ludwiczko formulated a very interesting hy hypothesis. The, the origin of this hypothesis is uh, is the following: uh, Dyson was a professor at Princeton, and then a young guy, uh, Montgomery, came and he was uh, introduced to, to Dyson. So. Uh, uh, Dyson asked you, ask him, so Montgomery, what are you doing these days? And uh, Montgomery said, you know, I am looking at the spacing between the uh, zeros of the Riemann function, and uh, they look like they scale like sine x over x, when x are the, the probability scale distance of uh, that, that function. So that Dyson said, oh, that's very interesting, because this is precisely my function. Dyson, Dyson, Dyson so this led uh, Dyson and Montgomery to formulate the hypothesis which Odwyszko checked on the on the computer. So in the 80s, Odwyszko calculated the distances of 176 million zeros around the zero number 10 to 20. Uh, this is a zero. I just I just decided to write it for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this is what he got. So this is the analytical result, the Dyson function, and these are the spacing of the, of the zero. So, so, so this gave a huge hope that maybe one day people will solve the Riemann hypothesis with the help of uh, random uh, matrices. Okay, so let, let me 
let me go to another uh, example on uh, another example devoted to uh, this time to the Avery Cardinals. You know, I have this uh, bad habit that when I travel in the plane, I put always my my pen or my uh, or my ballpen in my in my in my in my, uh, in my shirt here, and because of the decompression in the in the plane, usually the especially if I buy a cheap uh, pen, the, the ink uh, uh, leaks, and I am getting this, this beautiful uh, uh, pattern on my uh, on my deck. Uh, why it is uh, relevant? This is relevant because you see this kind of a uh, funny pattern here of uh, of this how this uh, how this. Uh, 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 how the spot develops, and actually the fluctuations are given by the by the airy, are given by the uh, airy function. One, one can check it, of course, with the ink and with the uh, and with the t-shirts. It doesn't work very well, and it's also expensive and irritates the wives. <laughs> so what you can you can you can do you can repeat it using some kind of uh, using some kind of uh, liquid. Crystals, various interfaces, either in spherical, uh, either in spherical uh, setup or in uh, setup. And what you do, you look at the fluctuations of the height of the uh, of the interface between the ink and the. Uh, ink. So this is a very beautiful example from nature uh, by Takeuchi, Sano, Sanomoto, and uh, and that Swan, which completely. Agrees with the uh, with, with the with completely agrees with the every uh, every pattern and uh, the, the dynamics of this is explained by another very famous equation called the Parisi Jacques equation. This was the uh, equation which was uh, suggested by three absolutely ingenious uh, physicists. However, uh, mathematically was badly defined. So uh, Martin Heidel. Uh, formulated the proper mathematical theory of the Carter Parisi Jungle equation and two years ago it was the So this is another. Uh, actually, there's another uh, funny uh, example uh, which is called Aztec Diamond. Uh, Aztec Diamond, uh, this is, uh, I just learned recently at the conference that it has nothing to do with the Aztecs, so all the, uh, the Aztecs and all the, all the physicists, uh, mathematicians from Mexico were very puzzled by this is the Aztec diamond. Basically, this is the following that you have dominoes. So you, you have, you have, you have uh, dominoes, and then what you, what you do, you have, uh, you have you, the domino you can put horizontally or rectangularly, but you may also put an arrow on the, on the domino, so it goes from this direction or from this direction, and then each one of those four, four uh, directions you uh, you give some color. Okay, then it looks uh, nice. So when you do this, uh, uh, when you when you do this uh, uh, tilings, uh, you see that you you start of course from a very regular way because you have no other way. But then in the middle you may you may do them on, on many many different ways. This is so called the so called example of the toad which means styling of Aztec, Aztec diamond. And of course, this is not spectacular if, the, uh, if this uh, uh, diamond is small, but if the diamond is large, okay? This is generated, of course, not by PhD students, but by computer, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you see a very interesting thing. You, you see here something which looks like a crystal, so, uh, because here all these dominoes are of that color, and here you have a disordered phase. So actually, mathematicians call it polar circle because this is a liquid line, and this is like, a, uh, and they love this, and there's a lot of work in that, in that field of tilings, and this uh, rough historical shape in the large, uh, in the thermodynamic body, they call it the polar circle. However, if you would look mathematically at the fluctuations of the polar circle, they are again given by the every function. Okay, and then perhaps the the last example, because time is uh, running uh, fast, this is this is uh, this is the example from my uh, old uh, backyard. Uh, we know that uh, the fundamental theory of strong interactions, uh, QCD, 
Yeah. It has a very interesting feature. It means it has an approximate symmetry which tells us that the uh, quarks are either left-handed or right-handed. Right okay? Approximate, because uh, it's, slow, it's very slow, very lightly violated. But if you look at the spectra, the spectra look completely different. The spectra do not see the symmetry, it looks like this left and right symmetry is completely completely distorted. For example, uh, when we have a proton, we don't have a, a twin of the proton with the, with the opposite parity. Okay? When we look at the pion, pion is the lightest particle, it has no brother. Okay? Et etc. Et et or if you have a brother, this brother is usually much, much higher. So this phenomenon is related to this, uh, the spontaneous breakdown of the of the of the chiral the symmetry in the QCD, and then this is almost like a magnetization. You may you may you may, uh, uh, you may uh, maybe I will give you I will give an example. Okay, you may you may uh, uh, you may take a piece of rock like a, like a magnetoid. Okay, and then uh, if you would imagine that uh, there are some creatures living on that, they would discover one big direction, the direction of magnetization, which would be a, a direction given them from the god. Okay? And then they would discover that if you take a charged particle and you would put it in a direction perpendicular to that arrow, that, the, that it would be going on cyclotron orbits. However, if you would push the particle, charged particle along this arrow, nothing, nothing would happen. Okay? So they live in a world in which symmetry is spontaneously Broken. Okay, the symmetry of the world is not SO3. Symmetry of the world is SO2 because there is only one arrow. However, if this if these guys would uh, manage to hit uh, the uh, the small piece of the universe, actually to the temperature which we call it Curie uh, temperature, which is more or less 1,000 uh, uh, centigrade, then magnetization would be gone. Okay, thermal excitations which will dissolve the uh, will destroy the magnetization, and then this guy will say, Hallelujah, the world has three SO3 symmetry, it's isotropic in each in each direction. Okay? So we are actually like these guys. Okay? We are actually like these guys. We are living in the world in which only vector part of the chiral symmetry is, is, uh, is uh, restricted and the axial is, is broken. However, nothing will us, prevents us, for example, in Geneva to, or, or Rick, to hit the small element of, this, of the space, so we will see the, the, the breakdown of the symmetry. This is very hard, so what we usually do, we check it on the lattice. Okay? So we check it on the lattice, and there is a marvelous uh, relation obtained by Banks and Kasher years, years ago, which tells you that the orbital parameter, this magnetization, which is called in QCD uh, uh, the quark condensate, is proportional to this average spectral density of the Dirac operator. So what do we have to do? We have to take a huge computer, okay, when we put the lattice, okay, and we, and we have a lattice, and then we we get some Bluani configuration, we write down this Bluani configuration, we plot it into our Dirac equation, and we solve the Dirac equation, okay? And we look at the eigenvalues of the Dirac equation. On lattice, the Dirac equation has real eigenvalues. Uh, so, and then I am doing it for years, okay? And then I can end in two situations. One situation is the following, that if I would look at the average spectral density of the Dirac operator in zero, I will either get something like that, so my average spectral density would be different from zero, and I would say, yes, I am in the broken phase, or if here, I would get something like that. I would say, oh, I destroyed my condensate. I, I have boiled out my condensate. I am in the phase, which is... Uh, so this is the... So, so you see, actually, looking, looking at the... Uh, looking at the eigenvectors of the Dirac operator, huge Dirac operator, something like on the lattice is like million by million, okay? In, in a narrow strip, can tell me in which phase I am. And I can... Uh, I can perform an experiment which I cannot perform, uh, or maybe I can perform it at uh, CERN, uh, but I, I'm not sure if I have really got that stage because it, it, it is a brick, then everything cools down, and there is it's a lot of mess, etc. So, so basically, what is, what is happening? Perhaps there is maybe one more thing which is worthy to, 
to, to, to comment. You see, there is a spectral density here, and here this is the four volume, okay? So you know that in quantum mechanics, if, if we have a non-interacting system, then the spacing between the levels would go like one over L, okay? So this would go like one over the fourth power of the, of the volume. So this means that if here I would have P to one, one fourth, and here I would have a P, I would never be able to get no zero uh, to zero condensate in the limit when the volume goes to infinity. The only, the only chance is that, uh, is that, that, uh, is that this uh, spectral density is extremely uh, enhanced at, at zero, and this, uh, this was actually this kind of uh, picture was uh, actually in the study of Dr. Pedavarko in his, his PhD. So this, uh, uh, this uh, enormous accumulation of eigenvalues uh, at zero could be visualized as a as a uh, as a collision of two tsunami waves. So so here here you probably recognize on the left hand side that this is the well-known Japanese uh, woodcut uh, by Hiroshige and, and with the help of uh, some tricks I, I created a second chiral wave and they collide. Okay? So, so when they uh, collide, this is what you see. This is the, that's what you see here. This is the first historical confirmation of this idea. And this is what you see, this is the average spectral density of the Dirac operator at half edge. So this is, this is this formula here, okay, when x goes to y, okay. And this is the, the measurement of the, this is the measurement of the eigenvalues of the lattice. This was, this was possible only in the, in the 90s, because at, the, at that time people developed the algorithm, which is called Lanzos algorithm, which allows to calculate something like 100 lowest eigenvalues of matrix million without diagonalizing all of them. So you see, this is a spectacular uh, example. Okay, so you may say, this is uh, absolutely fantastic, because this means that if Schrodinger equation for hydrogen atom gave us such an enormous plethora of uh, universal phenomena, this means that perhaps we can take every textbook in quantum mechanics, take one example after another, and at number we get fantastic new universality classes, etc., etc., etc. So, unfortunately not. And uh, unfortunately not means that uh, is the, the following. The, the third hero of the story, the Salomon Bofner, uh, uh, again almost 90 years ago, has proven a, a following that uh, you have an infinite sequence of polynomials satisfying the following eigenvalue equation, and then P, Q, and R must be respectively polynomial of the order of the second. Third or just a constant. That's all. And if additionally these polynomials have to be orthogonal on the real line, there is no other way. They could be only three of them. One is Jacobi, one is Locker, one is Hermit. Then if you if you uh, if you translate it into the random matrix models, it turns out that there are these three kind of with this kind of symmetry. The ensembles, Gaussian unitary ensembles, uh, Laguerre unitary ensembles, and Jacobi unitary ensembles, and all of them can yield sine, Airy, and Bessel function. In the case where the random matrix are filled with the complex, uh, complex matrix. So actually, this looks like the simple example which I have pulled for you, uh, the, the hydrogen atom completely covers everything. Okay, so this is, uh, so, so you may say, okay, what did you learn? Okay, what did you learn is that usually this kind of the results are obtained using a really high bro mathematics, extremely complicated uh, mathematics, either uh, called the Plancher and the Rotary limit or some kind of generalized seven point approximation or Riemann Hilbert tricks, etc. And in some sense, I have shown you almost all kinds of universalities in random theory using the elementary concept of quantum mechanics. So since I still have a uh, uh, 
three minutes. So let me tell you that there is another message from the seminar. Whenever you hear about the no growth theorem, there's always a way out. <laughs> okay, so the, the no, I don't know any really no growth theorem in, 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 in physics. There's always some, some way of twisting. So what we, what we can twist. Okay, you may say what uh, uh, what uh, uh, what Bochner did. Bochner looked at the second order differential equation. Okay, why not at the third order differential equation? Okay, if we look at the third order differential equation, of course, usually you see you would have a problem with uh, this. This is not symmetric, not Hermitian operator. So, so if we have such an object, usually. Even if the eigenvalues could, could be complex, or even if they would be real, uh, I have usually two sets of eigenvectors. I have right eigenvectors and I have left eigenvectors. And the right and left eigenvectors are not orthogonal within themselves, but they are orthogonal between themselves, they are by, by orthogonal. But now, so this is basically what it means. But now I may say, aha, but I can still define the kernel, which is like that, right and left. And I see that this kernel, when I square it, is still a projection operator. Because when I square it, left is orthogonal to, to right. And also, I know that there's a closure relation when it goes to infinity. This is a, this is, uh, they, they, they uh, form a complete. So this means that we may try to repeat the deformation case and to see if we can learn something like that. And this is precisely what we did with. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tarnowski, we solved, uh, I will show you the details. Uh, we solved, uh, we looked at two cases of, uh, very strange cases of random matrix models. One of them is that you take not one V-shot, but you take several v -shot. you multiply them. And you look if it has a universal kernel. It has, it's given by some, by some complicated function called Mayer G function. You can do the same with uh, some other deformation, which is called mutali Parodin, and probably with, with several others. Uh, so, so basically, our message is, is the following. Perhaps, uh, instead of looking one random matrix model, another random matrix model, another random matrix model, trying to solve them and to find some kind of a new phenomena, maybe one can ask the following question. Maybe. There, we, can, we can look at the Bochner theorem and we try to generalize. For example, we can say, what are the most general s situation with uh, third order differential equation? What kind of classes we have? Can we use them for the classification of random matrix models precisely like it was like that? So this is more or less the message which we try to, to, to spread. So this is a pedagogical value. This is, uh, this is the challenge. Uh, as I said, uh, I used here the case when beta is equal to, it means I was using the complex numbers. This means that my van der Mondian was to power square. And this is why all my trick with the slate at the terminal work. If I would have beta equal 1, I would have this uh, van der Mondian only to the power 1. So it, not would be as, it, it wouldn't be a, a slate at the terminal, it would be uh, a square root of the terminal. This is a very funny object, which in mathematics is called Pfaffian, and I don't know if it has a Pfaffa, if it has some kind of connotations to quantum mechanics, Pfaffian quantum mechanics. This is a, uh, can we have generalizations for other systems, etc. So basically, I can add here several questions to which I don't know to, how to answer, but my message was the following. There is an absolutely elementary way of understanding all this. Uh, nasty kernels, at least for beta equal, equal to using uh, quantum mechanics one. Uh, and the second that I, that would be extremely interesting to, to try to understand this classification on the, on the basis of generalization of the movement. Thank you for your attention. And the square to the terminal that is present in gravity, in like that G, maybe mm -hmm. there would be some use of this gate like Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And I have two questions. One is that uh, what's the dimensionality of this, or like under matrix theory? So it's like, does what it work in three dimensions, four dimensions? Zero. Zero. So this is actually where you can solve it, okay? Because in some sense, you may, you may, you may. Uh, you, uh, every field theory, you may, you may, you may think that this is like spatial number plus dimensions plus one. Okay? 
Okay? Quantum mechanics, this is zero plus one, okay, in, the, in, the, in this language. This is zero plus zero. Because you have operators, okay, they do not commute, okay, however they are filled with numbers. You can you can feel them you, you, so this is really like like a quantum field theory in one space point, okay, in, 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 in one point because as you see, these elements of these matrices, they have no dependence on space nor time. What is absolutely amazing that if you have a, such a complicated theory like, like QCD, for example, then generally, of course, this is a full dimensional theory, but it has, this is the beauty of universality. If you have a beauty of universality, you know that there are some very specific points, and in this point, this, point, this theory has the has the properties similar to another theory, which might be simpler. Mm. It might be a theory in two dimensions, but it also might be a theory in four, in zero dimensions. And this is the random matrix. This is the random matrix theory. So the only thing which which matters is some global global symmetry, which the, the parent theory and the and the random matrix universality class has to has to has, has to represent. So this is actually the reason why, why you can solve them, because you know if you go with lower number of dimensions, uh, but you solve them only in one point. For example, here you solve it exactly in the vicinity of, 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 of this gap. Here, of course, the, the full spectrum of the QCD and the full spectrum of this uh, of this uh, model would have nothing to do in common. So should we do it for every point to get like a full picture? Of no. No, no, because uh, because they touch only in few points. Mm -hmm. The duality is only in. Uh, so the whole idea, the, 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 the whole idea is to, if you have a complicated theory, is to identify the points which might be universal. Okay, and then when you identify the point which might be universal, you come with the magnifying glass and you compare it with a much simpler theory, basically a toy model, and then you you see the you, you see the, the agreement. So this is this is this is why we call it microscopic universality. But for example, in the whole QCD, it happens only in this one point. We are lucky that this one point is important for understanding the spontaneous breakdown of the chiral of the chiral, uh, chiral symmetry. But that's uh, 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 that, that's the feature. You 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 will, you will learn almost nothing about the theory when you look when you look further or you let learn something trivial. Is there any random tensor theory? Yes, there is. There is. is it working? Yes, there is, there is and uh, and it's uh, being developed using last ten uh, ten years. Uh, and there is also something for like large n, when n is the dimension uh, expansion. Yes, yes, there is a random tensor theory. No, it's much more complicated what an eigenvalue is. It's much more complicated, yes. The notion of eigenvalue yes, is even more yes, complicated yes, than yes. Of course, you can, you can, of course, you can do projections, you, can, you may do, do many, many, many things, but. Uh, but uh, for non Hermitian matrices? Uh, in your uh, in the language of quantum mechanics, what difference uh, is there between normal and non normal? Uh, okay, so uh, here, of course, uh, the, yeah, the difference here in this construction, I am precisely using the fact that I have left and right of, left and right eigen. Left and right, you have for uh, non normal because if they are normal. Uh, you can diagonalize the matrix with a single unitary transformation and the eigenvectors become. So here it's absolutely crucial that this kernel is uh, built from left and right. Uh, so all these guys are, are unknown. So, we have, so we still have like a third order differential equation, but we have some simplification for normal matrices? Or? You mean third order? Yes, third order, yeah. Yes, yes. So this is, uh, I, can, I, can, I, I don't want to, to, to put on you all this nasty. Not, not, not the formula, but basically, of course, uh, 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 in, in some sense, I am overusing the notation when I call it Hamiltonian, uh, etc. But I just wanted to build uh, the, the analogy, and you know very well that non-Hermitian quantum mechanics is not uh, something which is forbidden. Okay, when when you look at uh, when you look at the uh, 
finite li life of the, of the states, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, or if you take a Hermitian, uh, uh, if you take a Hilbert space and you and you separate half of the Hilbert space here and half, or, or a small chunk of Hilbert space, you know that everywhere the quantum mechanics is correct, but if you look at the quantum mechanics in the in the subsystem, it is non-hermitian because there is a flow of uh, probability to the, to, the, to the outer world. So, so this is a legitimative uh, statement, and there are many people are actually working with, with, with non-hermitian quantum mechanics. So. You know, may I have one more? Sure. If you add, uh, so, uh, so if we consider this diffusion as we did, uh, uh, if you add uh, time, can you also translate it? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. If, you can, if you can have some kind of a flow with this uh, non Hermitian Hamiltonians, yes. Or even Hermitian, I mean, even for this. Uh, this for the Hermitian, nothing will. For Hermitian here, nothing will probably change. Airy will be airy, but it will be probably. You, you can, it, it, it would be like. I, I think the only difference would be like. like we don't have Przemek here, who is a famous surfer. But, uh, <laughs> But the idea would be like that: that you would have your singularity, and this singularity will be, will be moving. Okay. Uh, so if you would put yourself in the frame that, that you are standing on, the, on this uh, on this singularity, then basically, you would, or if you would make snapshots, okay, the snapshots would be. So it, there would be just a parameter of this. Just a parameter of actually in, in the Gaussian case, just a dispersion with your scale. We see. Yes, absolutely. So you said that you want to generalize this construction so that the kernel is associated to some exotic quantum mechanics. Yes. Would you, so if you get that, would you know how to convert it back into an explicit random matrix model, or it's a difficult question? No, I would, what, if I would know, I would, I would... It is, of course, a difficult question. But uh, my idea, what usually people do nowadays, nowadays Okay. They, for example, five or six years ago, they, it was a huge surprise. It was a huge surprise when they, when they took, uh, they took the product of two Ishar examples. Okay, such such object is, uh, is, uh, is uh, non hermitian but it has a, it, it has a nice feature. It is radially symmetric. So basically, the, the spectrum is radially symmetric. So this is a quasi-dimensional, uh, uh, quasi-dimensional. Uh, case and when they uh, and then what they did they discovered that this is again so-called determinantal process so everything can be written the probability density function can be written as a square of the slate of the terminal this was and then when they looked what what is the elementary function here it was a function which is called Mayer G function some kind of a horrible uh, generalization of hypergeometrical function. But this triggered a flurry of activities in this field because whoa, we had a university after new university after 20, 30 years, people got a new university then, and this new, new, new this university is different when you multiply three, when you multiply four, when you multiply five. For each number, you get a different university class, and then people started to combine. They say, oh, maybe we'll take a completely Gaussian thing, we'll divide it by another Gaussian um, uh, complex matrix, we'll try multiplying them, maybe we'll get something new. That's a, so, so they, uh, or for example, like in this Borodin case, they say, oh, we can add another determinant. Maybe we can, instead of, uh, instead of one, uh, we can add another determinant with some power alpha, where alpha could be square, could be actually a fractional number, could be... And, and then it turned out that uh, in many of these cases, people can find this determinantal, uh, this determinantal structure, usually obtained in terms of rather horrible, horrible, horrible kernel. So what we, what, what, what we did actually with, with this trick, we, we recovered all these nasty equations, which, uh, all these nasty formula for kernels which people, people had, in one line, in one line, precisely using this this trick. So, so one way, of course, is is the following: look at the literature, find example which people uh, solved, okay, and then uh, and then try to map it on, on this what uh, in this scenario. So instead of calculation based on thirty pages, you get this, this result in one line. 
Okay? But of course, the much more interesting and harder question is, is the following. What is the list of all possible random matrix models of all possible kernels which you, which you can get? And, uh, and what I think, I think that this Bochnerian way of thinking may indeed give you the answer. We will tell you, oh yes, when we have a third order uh, equation, maybe we have six classes, okay? And then I can ch check, okay, ah, this was done, this was done, what about that class? Maybe uh, it's still not obvious for me that knowing that, uh, that class, I would know how to write a, uh, explicitly a random matrix model, but at least I, uh, I have a hint. So you are saying that quantum mechanical problems with polynomial solutions are rare, and you classify all of them as Bochner did for yes. quadratic, yes. Yes. Uh, yes. for, for uh, yes. secondary. Yes, yes. 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 That's, that's, that's true. And, that, and basically, the Bochner theorem has a direct. This is quite amazing that that it, it is not really somehow stressed in the literature. This was amazing for me. That basically, this uh, Bochner uh, theorem actually explains you. <laughs> Why you have this uh, three different uh, kind of uh, of, uh, of kernels and and, and uh, all these different structures and uh, and it looked like uh, people didn't make the, the maybe they knew about it as you but but at least uh, uh, they didn't make that link so this is why when I started that seminar I put all these three guys in a, in a, in a one row. Within the scale of two or three years, each of them did an absolutely fundamental discovery in mathematics, in statistics, and in quantum physics. And it looked like uh, after 90 years old, still they didn't <laughs> they didn't unravel the today. So this is why I found it quite interesting. Okay, so if there are no further questions, so let us thank the speaker. <laughs>